Thank you, Hans, and, and Gültin. Gültin. Yeah, no, no, no problem for the invitation. I'm, I was really pleased to come here again and to see that so many of you came to this conference irrespective of these intrusive measures by different governments. It's now about a short history of the Swiss Constitution. We have several constitutional subjects today. We, we have almost a Swiss day, I think, today, uh, with Daniel Model in the beginning and my speech, then you about the subject that has to do with Switzerland. So, And here now about the history, a short history. It's a small country, so the history will be short. Um, an official version, so to speak, once you ask what is the history of your constitution, you would hear perhaps it starts with a myth. Back in 1091, um, 1st of August, you know, our national holiday, that famous oath of Rütli. Um, I'll come to that more in detail. Then we have um, a phase of the so-called Old Confederation, uh, where this start of three cantons grew up to 13 cantons. Um, then we have an accident, so to speak. In 1515, there was a battle and the defeat of the Swiss um, at Marignano. I will come to that. It has a certain role within the history of our constitution. Then we have a long phase, I would say, of overlapping treaties alongside many, many religious and political conflicts as a, well, that's a constitution of mutual conflict, so to speak. Then we have now, for the first time, a top-down structure implemented by Napoleon, the Republic Helvetique, according to this liberal, uh, liberal quote, unquote, um, intentions of uh, Napoleon. Then we have a phase, um, in the meantime, it's 22 cantons, new cantons coming up. Um, this is not a top-down, but it is again a bottom-up structure. Uh, in the first phase, they call it restoration. Later on, it's regeneration. We, we come to that uh, in detail. We have a small civil war. Um, all these national countries had civil wars in the 19th century, so small countries had a small civil war. That's our Sonderbundskrieg, I come to that. Actually, that was, you can compare it with, you know, Italy or um, the United States. Um, it's a sort of conflict between unionists that won, that, that won that war, and federalists. So, as everywhere in that area. And then we have in 1848 um, the, uh, I would say, the first official constitution of this kind of state, Switzerland is today, and everybody says today this is the birth of the modern liberal democratic Switzerland. We are so proud of, um, I'll, I'll come to that later. And since then, there are numerous partial and to general revisions of our constitution without um, heavy material impact. Even uh, relatively recently, in 1999, um, Switzerland adopted a completely new constitution, but without material changes. It was just a formal brush up, so to speak. So this is the official row, not too interesting. Now, let's start with this myth. This is more, um, you know, this wakes you up a little bit after lunch. Um, this beautiful place here, the Rütli, um, where this oath took place, in a summer night, that must have been a night, a light night in a way. Um, uh, if you look at Wikipedia, which is of course a sort of 
big truth, you know. Um, uh, they say that's the first constituent assembly of continental European, so to speak. So there we had a, a sort of, of first constitution adopted by this assembly. But what took really place according to the myth, and this means according to Friedrich Schiller in this famous novel, William Tell, the big hero of Switzerland, hero for freedom against tyranny. In this, in this novel, he described quite precisely this, um, this Rütle meadow surrounded by high rocks and wooden, wooded ground. In the background, the lake is observed, and over it, a moon rainbow in the early part of the scene. I never saw a moon rainbow, did you? Um, but maybe at that time there was a moon rainbow. The prospect is closed by lofty mountains with glaciers rising behind them. The stage is dark, but the lake and glaciers glisten in the moonlight. So a beautiful scene, huh? according to Schiller. Uh, there it is. Rutley, you can go there. Uh, it's not just with Schiller, but it's a true place in Switzerland. You can go there. You don't see the glaciers here anymore. Maybe that's because of the climate change in the meantime, you know. But it's there. You can go as a tourist. Now, let's look a bit closer at that happening there. Um, when these people coming together, these three cantons, the representative of three cantons. What did they say? What did they swear, according to um, Schiller? First, sweary, th this is an old-fashioned translation I found somewhere in the internet. Sweary the oath of our confederacy. Now, we shall be unified, a fork of brothers, never to part in danger or in death, they repeat these words with three fingers raised, you see it? So I put it in red because it's a socialist part, you know, unification. Then they said other things too. We swear to put our trust in God most high and not to quail before the might of man. Okay, this is uh, resistance, that, that's okay. And then what is really fine, I think, that's why I put it in blue. We swear we will be free as were our fathers, and sooner die than live in slavery. All repeat as before and embrace each other. So this is the precise wording of what took place there, according to Schiller. Now there is another actor beside this Rütli community, namely the, the hero of the novel, you know. There I can introduce him. William Tell with his son. He actually is not a politician. He does not take place at the Rütli. He is not the debater. Um, he is the actor. He acts. He doesn't talk very much. He acts. He's a hunter by profession. That's why his, his um, crossbow, he shoots not on tyrants, uh, except sometimes, but on, uh, on animals, on deer, uh, on, on, on birds as a hunter. And he is occupied with his family, himself, his house. And that's why this is a famous, famous um, wording in Switzerland. This novel is quite, quite well known. The ox im Haus erspart den Zimmermann. Uh, this, this says that and so he, he works at home, he repairs some, some door, and then he says, and so methinks the door will hold a while the axe at home of safe and saves the carpenter. He has not to hire other people, he makes what he has to do himself. That's William Tell. And now the evil part, the third part, this is Hermann Gessler. This is the incorporation, the symbol of, of wickedness. Um, for instance, he says, and he is the representative. Also, say what you please, I'm the emperor's servant, and my first care must be to do his pleasure. 
So he represents some, represents some higher concentrated big power here down on this world at this place. He is the personified brutality in this novel. For instance, in a very well-known scene too, he says to tell this. You shall shoot an apple from your boy's head I do desire and command it so. He was, he was um, offended, Hermann Gessler, that till that tell did not, you know, incline before him. And that's why he said, you're a good hunter, I, I was said. So now I will check whether that's true. You will shoot an apple from the head of your boy. And tells, oh, no, please not. And, and uh, all, all around standings were, were shocked by that, but he insisted. The story went well. He, he, he hit the apple and not the head of his son, uh, and he took revenge after that. I will come to that too. So this is the evil, bad, wicked Gessler. So our constitutional players, one could say, we have this assembly, we have Tell, and we have Gessler. And for the, for the um, interface, so to speak, you have this aggressive oppression by um, Gessler. You have resistance, the collective resistance from the whole group, and you have the individual defense from Tell. What is interesting, by the way, and I will come to that later, what is the relation, the internal relation, so to speak, between this group and the individual. So is that perhaps also a sort of aggression within the small internal relationship, an aggression towards the individual, and as a consequence, a defense, a reaction um, against this whole group. So these are these constitutional players, and now um, what happens? Um, of course, collective defense, there nothing happens. They discuss on the Rütle. But the individual defense, there something happens. After that scene I mentioned before with the apple and, and the boy and so on, um, some scenes later, this happened. I will show it to you a bit closer. Here you see, according to this Act 4, scene 3 of the novel, Tell shot Gessler dead. He took revenge um, for this humiliation, for this brutality. And the last word Gessler says, cries out, according to Schiller, that shot was Tell's. And that was the starting shot for the whole revolution then. Then, after that, those politicians, you know, from the Rütli, they started then their revolution. But that was the starting shot. Without the individual resistance, that collective resistance would not have taken place. I like that picture very much and the connection of it. But now let's go closer to the constitution. Now we have this Three parts, we know in the meantime, the red one, we shall be unified, a fork of brothers. If you translate it into constitutional terms, um, you think about statist collectivism. And even you think about concentration of power. So even this enemy, in a way, is included in this red line, collectivist part of that constitution. On the other side, and this, there you have a top-down approach. On the other side, or on the bottom side, you wouldn't say statist collectivism. You would, in constitutional terms or in international terms, perhaps, you would say this is rather a non-aggression treaty between these people. Not, not even mainly against a third, but within. We promise to each other that we won't attack each other. And historically, 
this was what happened in that time. The other one, the, the red um, part, here of course you have this bottom-up approach, and uh, um, this, this, this middle part, which is perhaps you could call it a defense alliance, that is not historical. Historical is just this bottom part of, in principle, mutually not attacking each other, of course, with some aspects also to this third power, this Habsburgian power. So we have these elements and mainly the difference between that top-down aspect and the bottom-up aspect. Now, um, out of this myth, of course, it's a sophisticated myth, according to Schiller, we have sort of uh, contradicting constitutional principles. We have on the top side this united collectivity, unified general goals. You have monopolized power. They all together form a power. And you could call it an archist structure. This is a notion not often used, but sometime, sometimes it's used and it means a structure with Ar archi, arche, Greek, archi, with a, a monopolized top instance. This is an archist structure. We have this on the one side, and there you have this top-down approach, and on the other side, on the bottom side, you have the contrary. You have separated individuality, incorporated in William Tell, you have a variety of many personal goals. You have decentralized powers. And you have, as a consequence, an anarchist structure, which is essentially a bottom-up structure. And now to put it more, I mean, conventionally into the content of a constitution, how we, we know constitutions. Um, we have in the Constitution, in the Swiss Constitution, in the American Constitution, in the German Constitution, all, all these, these well-known um, constitutions of national, national states, you have um, these items. You have on the arch archist goals or structures, there is, you know, these goals of security as a state function, ecology, energy, education, culture, sport, infrastructure, communication, all as they say function that the state must supply to society, then good things, you know, prevention of po poverty. And what, what is interesting in this connection you have here, branches of government, which is or the, the aspect of branches of government, which is a, which is a, a treacherous, expression, branches, three branches of one tree, you know. You do not have three trees, you have one th tree with three branches, so all belongs to the same. So what, what is intended, um, division of power, um, is the opposite is true, it's a concentration of power, three branches in one tree. So, these are the typical red aspects, um, archist aspects. And now, on the bottom side, you have anarchist elements that are also in these um, conventional um, constitutions. The fundamental rights, such as life lim and liberty, so the classical liberal rights, freedom rights, negative rights, property rights, free speech, and so on. The rule of law that statist activities or state activities must be governed by law, which is simply not the case because, as you know, it's <coughs> the state itself who defines the laws and he privileges himself all the time. So there should be a rule of law in this constitution or it's written in these constitutions, but it's not the fact. Separation of power, there is no separation of power, there is concentration of power. Um, 
And accordingly, you have this top-down aggressiveness, as we, we currently know uh, very, very strongly. And you, on the other side, you have this bottom-up defensiveness. Um, now, again, to go back on the historical context, now on the time beam, uh, let's start again with this uh, 1291 myth. And then one could say in Switzerland we have an anarchist tradition. I in this sense, I, I developed now in the sense of this blue part here. Uh, we have for first this old confederation, which, as I told, was not much more than a, a, a non-aggression treaty, with growing numbers of cantons. And um, afterwards, we had this permanent conflict um, phase in the beginning, that was rather religious conflicts between Catholics and Protestants, um, and in other places too. And um, uh, later on, more political conflicts between conservatives and liberals. And um, uh, one very prominent conflict was, was that small war I mentioned before, this Sonderbundskrieg that took place in 1847. One could say until then we had this anarchist tradition of the Swiss constitution. There were some exceptions. In 1515, I mentioned it briefly in the beginning, uh, there was an attempt by this confederation to become a global player. Uh, to become a military force to incorporate the Duchy of Milano. But the French king did not agree with that, and he was quite stronger than the Swiss, and um, defeated them at the Battle of Marignano in northern, northern Italy um, heavily. That was a big defeat, but good businessmen, as they were, they entered then into a long-time contract with with the, the French, uh, French king to supply mercenaries and to get money. That was a long time good cooperation. One could say that was an archist error besides this anarchist tradition. But then came archist elements. First, I already mentioned Napoleon in 1798 with his Republic Helvetic. Then again, one phase, a blue one, um, that went back to a decentralized structure, just a treaty between, in the meantime, 22 cantons. This is the phase we will hear something about in the next speech, I think, from Hans. Then we have this, I mentioned already, this famous um, constitution of 1848. Um, which was contrary to international law because it was forced to the minority by a majority, even though, according to international law, unanimity would have been required. Um, so this is typical top-down, you know, archist structure. Then th that, that's a, a later um, amendment of the constitution where the, the vote, the public vote, the people's vote, on, uh, not only on elections, was introduced. Then the codification of civil law. I added that after the speech of this morning of um, Stefan Kinsella, when, when he talked about what is the law, constitution of law. Not now to explain it in detail, but it's typical that around 1900 in Switzerland, there was a first unified civil code. Not the constitution, but the civil code, but in close connection with this unification and top-down developments. And since then, just formal update, as I told you until now. So one could say, and this is so the overall picture, after this anarchist tradition until the 19th century, um, we have a clearly archist development like a bit everywhere, or one could say, out of Gessler became Napoleon, and out of Napoleon became our today's federal state. So this is an epigone of Gessler, if you want. That's not the official version of the history of um, 
Swiss constitution. Now, what is then the content now of this um, constitution today? Uh, if you look at the today formally being in force, um, you see these elements we just met before, these anarchist goals, and on the other side, this anarchist element. But if you look at it closer, then you see that the aggressiveness of the red part is becoming more and more and stronger and stronger. And to be it, to say it a little bit simplified, the blue part is crossed out. Um, if you have now discussions about, you know, reducing fundamental rights, personal freedom, freedom of, of, of business um, by these corona measures, um, you lose almost always in Switzerland. So I think this is unfortunately a bit um, the situation we have uh, today. Um, now, to look back again, why did it come that after such a long blue tradition, um, anarchist tradition, um, things like that, that heavily anarchist structures came into you know, um, political life of Switzerland? I look back, very much back. I broadened the view to 10,000 before Christ. Um, and here too, I think, you see a long development uh, underlying the anarchist tradition we have in Switzerland, of course, in other places also, maybe in Switzerland more than in other places, but this is not just, you know, this did not just start in 1291, but that's, that's the result of a really long development. And I think you can really go back, I'm not a specialist for that, but I'm quite convinced if you look at anthropological or sociological um, theories and, 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 and uh, uh, studies, then you see that you can say, at least since this Neolithic revolution, you have concrete, structures where you can say um, these are decentralized structures, diversity, you can say anarchist structures. If you go all through that, you know that there is agriculture coming up in that area, also physical change, lactose tolerance, then settlements, you have family structures, small tribes, local princes, federalist structures, and so on, um, until, I would say in Switzerland, until 1848. So this is a long tradition, but why and where does this red line come from? And there too, of course, you have a certain tradition, not that long, but you have some. So if you see these national states were pre predeceased, more before those were absolutist states. We had earlier the Roman Empire. We had a good presentation about yesterday. Um, but where did those power, these big power concentrations come from? And I think what is interesting, they come from an event not too far away. It's just 5,000 years old. That, that's quite recent, huh? that's, that's yesterday, if you look at it in a, in a broad view. Yesterday, big cities arising, namely in Mesopotamia, um, Uk, Uruk, Nineveh, um, later Babylon, later the, um, the Egypts. Um, so this was a new phenomenon. This was not, this came not out of a long tradition. So I, I, I try to picture it like that, I think, out of this sedentariness um, connection, um, you know, a certain um, accumulation of many people at the same relatively small place and so on. Um, so that gave rise to these new and um, very impressive uh, power concentrations. So that was a, a new um, uh, development. So one could say, the long-term development or evolution is on the blue side. It's an individual one, while this red 
top-down, aggressive, power-concentrated aspect is a relatively new development. You can even look further back. This is beyond, you know, um, um, philosophy or history. It's just, I would say, pure, pure natural science. Seven million years back. Um, um, lengthily before Homo sapiens. You see at the right side, Homo sapiens, I put there, maybe he will become even more sapiens than he is today, somewhere in tomorrow, which says in 100,000 years or so. Um, Homo sapiens, as such, he is, I think the time frame given to him is, is around minus 500,000. Um, language coming much later, about 100,000, but this is about like us, in a way. Um, but there are pre-pre-ancestors going much back, Homo erectus, which was an important thing to, to stand on, on two, two legs instead of four legs, to look around, to judge the situation. And I think what is interesting, back to early hominids, to primoto, primatomorphs, so species, lengthily before us that were sort of ancestors of later hominids and uh, um, th these kind of species, until then the Homo sapiens, what is typical for all them, their big abilities, their big skills, their special skills that gave them advantages over much stronger other animals was individual self-consciousness was self-responsibility, was self-competence. Each is competent for himself, which does not exclude to cooperate in a group of hunters, for instance. Not ex exclude at all, but any combination, any group is based on each member's decision or more or less conscious will. And I would say, and this is not ideological, but just as a natural fact, that this is maybe the most prominent aspect in the whole behavioral revolution of man. Of course, I, I said the title, A Long History of Trial and Error. Um, uh, you know, evolution is not according to a plan, to a goal. It goes as it goes. And um, maybe there are developments that are not um, successful, that they do not prove useful in real life. So huh? there are, besides successes, there are errors, one there, one there, always errors, but they, they have um, vanished, they have disappeared because that's, that's the, the essence of being an error. It didn't prove useful, so it disappeared. Here one, there one, here one. And now there is an interesting small error happening just recently, just recently, about 5,000 years ago. It's not a small error. Errors go by, let's hope. And if you have these seven million, you know, this broad view, you even have to take the magnifying glass to look at. And what was this error that took place recently? It was the state. The state is an error of the evolution of human behavior. I think this is maybe the most accurate description of this phenomenon, this strange phenomenon of these accumulations of power that, um, you know, that they contain an attitude that some organs of this organization are competent for all individuals. This is an error of evolution, and I'm quite convinced that this error will go by. 
if I'm optimist, it will go by while humans remain alive. Um, which says that they follow libertarian ideas, for instance, and, and you know, realize that was an error, okay? You can make error, but you can become wiser, and that's why we leave that alone and go, go on on the blue line instead of the red one. If I will be pessimist, which, which is not the case, then it will also disappear, but along with the species. That's not excluded, I would say. Um, once you see these developments to the world state, then I could imagine such scenarios, um, which makes it even more useful to work on the blue line. Now, um, to sum up or to come to a, a conclusion, again, the, in Switzerland again, huh? very, very small, and um, you can overview it. Uh, we have this constitution, we saw this high aggressiveness right now especially, and we have seen that the blue part is away. This is, as I said before, showed before, this is our two days um, constitution. Now, actually, the medicine is quite simple. We have to, to change the crossing out. We have to do this. And that would be the constitution on the blue line, a constitution that omits all these red things. Um, we do not need them because, as you see, out of this very long evolutionary tradition, all what functions in human societies is what is ultimately based with the individual. So the bottom-up approach, the defensive approach against power structures. And all what is then, let's say, in a level above the individual's general social aspects, they too will be influenced bottom-up. There will, no be no, there will be no program or goals or anything over individual goals on that level. Um, there will be an outcome of many, many individual decisions, corporations, always based with the individuals bottom up. And that, of course, will have an outcome also in higher spheres of society. I think that would be the approach. So, if this is true, so we know the solution, so we know it, oh, let's do it. But um, it's, it's not that easy to defend this blue part, um, to realize this essential aspect, this defensiveness of this blue part. I, I, I'm not sure what I should do. I just know that William Tell would know what to do. So, thank you for your attention.